Hello and welcome. Thanks for joining me. I am Natasha from Telltale Hearts and this is Storytelling Module 2, Bringing Stories to Life in the Home. Thank you so much for joining me this late afternoon and I'd also like to thank also that we are also grateful to the Abu Dhabi Early Childhood Authority for making this initiative a reality. So, Welcome. Today we're going to be looking at how to use visual aids and sensory ways of being able to enhance stories in the home. But first, just let's recap from last week. I hope that you managed to have a go at a couple of those tasks that I set last week and I hope that you managed to find out what might your child or children wish for and did you find another story with a wish in it? Mm. And maybe you manage to replace some of those words with your own gestures. I wonder what words they might have coaxed out of your children. Well, if you have any comments, if you have any questions during this presentation, then please put them in the chat box and I'll be sure to collect them and answer them at the end of this session. But without further ado, let's get on to visual aids and how we're going to enhance stories today. So just a little bit about me. Again, I am from a performing background. So I trained in theatre, but also in storytelling and puppetry and comedy and all manner of things. But one of the things I did was look at Eastern theatre styles and how they can be used to enhance um, Western ways of working. Um, and as we know, there are many rich stories from all over the world and most particularly in the Middle East. So how can we um, enhance stories with, with visual aids, with things that you have in your home that you don't actually have to go out and purchase? So we'll have a look at what some of those, what make good um, visual aids for stories and also we shall look at um how to how to help bring the page to life so what does make a good story for children hmm. has anybody got any ideas that they think if you have got any thoughts of what makes a good story for for young children then pop them in the chat box and i shall pick them up um, and whilst you're doing that, I'll give you a few of a few points that I think make good stories for children. So one of them is relatable characters. So important that young children have relatable characters in the story that they can identify with. Um, also, a clear structure it's really helpful if there is something of an introduction an introduction to maybe the characters um, and that clearly um, the dilemma develops during the middle of the story and there's a very clear resolution of that di dilemma that happens at the end so i think those clear structuring is really helpful for young children as well anyone want to put some of their input into the chat box. Mm, I don't see any, but I'm sure you've got plenty of ideas. Well, another good thing I think for stories for young children is humour. And we're going to be looking a lot at humour in the story this afternoon. Humour is a great way to engage young children and it's, it's a common human experience as well to laugh, not just at, but to laugh with something as well. To me, humour is really important in stories for young children. I'm sure some of you also use stories to help teach moral lessons. They're a very good way of being able to give guidance and instruction. And sometimes the best way of doing that isn't always by having the most, by underlining it and really ramming home what this, um, what this moral lesson is about. But actually sometimes it's those moral lessons that can be a little bit, more subtle um, that can actually have the most value. Chil never underestimate the intelligence of, of young children and being able to work out what a story is actually saying. You know, they quite often pick it out even when it's really quite subtle. Um, 
So I think a relatable dilemma as well, something that speaks of their experience, what, um, what's meaningful to them, things like, um, things like sharing is a, is, a, is a big thing and coming to terms with difficult things or routines, things that are really relatable and empathy. For me, that's really key in a good story for young children is developing their empathy, helping them to empathize with another character that might be quite different from them or being able to put themselves in that character's shoes in that situation. It's a wonderful way of developing their sense of empathy and compassion. So I think that's really important. And of course, the language, the language that we use, simple phrases, keywords, rhyme, rhythm, picking up a cadence, doesn't have to be rhyming couplets, but quite often there might be a poetic structure or very simple, succinct, short sentences that are very easily understandable, but the way they're put together with others maybe has a little bit of a poetic ring to it too. And finally, as I don't have any of your ideas in the chat box, finally, I think surprise. Surprise is a wonderful, oh, it's a wonderful way of um, drawing them into a story, surprising them at the end. How is this going to end? Oh, it's that anticipation. And we talked about that a little bit in session one. Um, how a story is going to end, those surprising elements, those are really excellent. Um, ingredients to make a good story for young children. So moving on, how can we enhance children's understanding of a story through visual aids? So I've put this into kind of four different, four different points. I'm just going to talk through these points and then we're going to see them in action in a story from Poland, which is the Dragon of Krakow. We're not gonna see it just yet. I just want to go through the four points, but you'll see them working in that story. So the first point is that visual aids can really help in that world building, in providing clues that can help encourage children to visualize that story. So for example, in the story last week, in The Fisherman and the Ring, the skirt that I was using in that story had the long blue fabric throngs that helped make the waves. And we also created that soundscape, but it was the cloth waves that really help the children to visualize that they are at the seashore, that they are at the sea for that story. And also um, the socks or the gloves on the fish help them to be able to connect the, mm, that's a fish as, as part of that character in the story. So secondly, the physical scene setting, how a story moves from one place to another, it's a little bit like a um, mapping and it's a really good way of getting children to help sequence events in terms of what happened at the beginning and what happened later in the story. So at the beginning, we know we're at the seaside in terms of the fisherman and the ring because of the blue skirt and the sea we've set that scene but later on after the boat has come out after at the end towards the end of that story Adisa goes to the market and all of the um, cloth from the skirt gets picked up and you move into like a different space if you, if you like so it helps to map out the different places. And in this next story, you're gonna see that even more clearly, how the visual objects, the visual aids help to mark out where each part of the story is rooted because that's really key to this, how this story works. So the third thing is how the visual aids um, can help to make the plot easier because quite often, especially in those myths and legends, there might be, and, and with trickster type of stories, there's quite often quite a complex element to a story that's quite hard for a young child that's not experienced that or, or um, 
it's difficult to imagine or visualize it and those visual aids can really help with that so there's a situation in um, the dragon of Krakow where the villagers are going to have to find a way to get rid of the dragon and the way in which they manage to do that is really quite complicated idea so I use the visual aids in this story to really help make it clear to young children what's happened and I usually check in afterwards as well and I've never um, I've always heard the right responses they've never not answered correctly on on that but you'll see that for yourself shortly and the fourth thing and this is really important I think the most fundamental and important thing of all is it develops the imaginative possibilities for children um, so in the way that I established this story I do it first by setting up a cave and then asking them to imagine what kind of creature might live inside this cave. Now, if I hadn't created a cave, I think the ideas would be very different. But being able to create a cave and create a sense of that starts to really draw out the imagination of children. And a great way of doing that is by using objects, and this is where we come to what what kind of objects make for those really good visual aids and it's objects that can be used in quite a few different ways and in early years we called them intelligent materials so i've got i've got an example of um, in, an intelligent material that i often use and these are just a couple of car sponges i don't use them to clean the car i hasten to add i, I use them instead for doing this kind of thing. So these can easily be, they can help make a character or they could help make an animal. <laughs> or, mm, mm, they might make a very different kind of character. Mm. Or another kind of character, or hello, kind of character, or maybe or even so something that's very simple and can be used in lots of different ways opens up lots of op opportunities for how you might use it even for how you might read a story one two three time for a story what will it be a story for you and me oh this is a very good story it's a story all about a very Mm. Mm. Vain enchantress. Mm. So those are my car sponges. But it just gives you an idea of how an intelligent material can be used in lots of different ways, providing you're giving some context to how the how this object is being used. So let's see what visual aids I use when it comes to the dragon of Krakow. So when you're watching this story just have a look for first what different props and objects I use to tell the story. Secondly what characters and what beast, the clues in the title, <laughs> what beast are brought to life and what visual aids are used to do that. And thirdly, how I manage to get that complicated part of the plot with how the village get rid of the dragon. How do I manage to do that by using those simple objects and materials? So have a watch and I hope you enjoy it. This story is a little bit longer. It's just, just short of 15 minutes. This story is the Dragon of Krakow and it's one of my favourites. Let's play the video. 
Hello, it's another time for a suitcase story in lockdown. Shall we see what this story is going to be about? Let's have a look inside the magic case. Well, I can see that our next story is from the same place as my slippers, from Poland. And, uh, oh, this story it was told to me when I was out for a wonderful walk. Do you remember those times before lockdown when you could go for a fantastic walk all over the place in lovely natural landscapes? Well, when I was traveling in Poland, I came to the edge of a beautiful village nestled into the hills and there all the villagers were sitting around a great Can you guess? That's right, fire. And as they sat around the fire, they cooked on long sticks the fresh fish that they had caught. And as they cooked their fish, they told me a story about a deep, dark cave. And this cave, it was set in the foot of the tall mountains. And um, covering the cave was lots of uh, thick, squelchy moss. And hanging in front of the cave were lots of long, dangly vines. Hello? 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 What kind of creature do you think might live in a cave like this? Hmm? Do you think it could be um, a giant spider? Hmm? Or could it be a... Uh, a bat or maybe it was a <laughs> dinosaur mm -hmm. well let's find out shall we in the story now this cave was also next to a long sploosh sploosh flowing river and on the other side of the river there was a shplup, shplup village the elders of the village warned all of the villagers not to set foot in the cave because it was said that a great fire breathing dragon lived inside mm. One day, three friends decided to set off on an adventure. Dun, 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 dun. Shling, shling, shling. Ready for action. <laughs> no problem. Hey, how you doing? Huh? Oh no. Oh no. Oh no. The three friends decided to cross the river, one by one. Da 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 da! Shling, shling, shling! Ready for action! Ah! Sploosh! 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 Yeah! No problem! Hey! How you doing, huh? Heave ho! Heave ho! Heave ho! Yeah. Oh no! Oh no! Yikes! 
Oh. <laughs> The three friends walked inside the cave and from deep inside came a breathing sound. Oh no! Oh no! Oh no! From deep inside the cave came the fire breathing dragon. Now this is the um, PG rated bit. So if the adult you've got with you is a little bit scared, I suggest that you might take their hand or maybe you want to give them a bit of a cuddle. Okay, are you ready? Let's see this dragon then, shall we? From that moment on, the poor villagers knew no peace. Each night, the dragon would fly out of the cave, would steal one of the villagers' sheep, and he would eat it for its tea. Well, those villagers, they organized a meeting to see if they could come up with good ideas of how to get rid of the dragon. Perhaps you can have a little bit of a chat with the adult with you and see if you've got a good idea for how to get rid of the problem of the dragon, hmm? Well, they came up with fighting it off. This is what happened. Da -dum, ba -da -da -dum. Shling, 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 shling. Ready for action. Hmm. On guard, dragon. Shling, shling, shling. No problem. Put him up, dragon. Oh no. Oh no. Oh no. Oh. Nothing those villagers did worked. But there was one. Mm. Shepherd's boy. And he had lots of woolly. Want to feed the sheep. Great. Now this shepherd's boy's name was Krakos. I don't want any big stupid dragon eating my little woolly sheep. No, 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 no. Krakos must have idea to save sheep. Krakos thinking. Krakos thinking. Krakos thinking. Ding! Krakos have idea to save sheep, but I need a great chef. Who here is a great chef? Oh, we have here a great chef. Come here, move sheep, beep, beep, beep. Yes, and uh, 
Your name is Jeffrey. Hello, Jeffrey. And you're a good chef, Jeffrey. Yes. Okay. If you want to join with us in this part of story, you can now pause the video in a moment and you can find your own mixing bowl and wooden spoon. Yes. So you can press pause to find those things and then rejoin. Yes. Welcome back. So, Jeffrey, you are going to make for us a fiery, spicy paste. Jeffrey, what ingredient do we need for this spicy paste? We need chili. Yes. Ch chili, yes. Here is a chili. Now, the smaller the chili, the hotter the chili. Jeffrey, can you see this chili? Just a bit. Yes. Great. Here, you crush the chili for me. You crush with spoon. Crush, 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 crush. Good. Now, what else are we needing, great chef, to make spicy paste? To make fiery paste, oh. we need mm. something fiery, yes. Have you an idea? Yes. How about a bit of Pepper, huh? Oh. Yes. What else you thinking, Jeffrey? I am um... to make a nice sauce. What do we need for a fiery sauce? Spicier? Mm. I don't know. A spicy sauce? <sighs> you like curry, Jeffrey? Oh yes. Shall we do a curry sauce? Oh, yes. 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 And give a good mix, Jeffrey. Yes. Okay, I try. Yes. Yes. Just a little. Mmm, it's very good. Oh, 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 very hot. Oh, yes, it's good, Jeffrey. Now, Jeffrey. You need to put this spicy paste all over the sheeps. Yes? So we do like this. Yes? And you rub in. Okay, for me? Yes? Yes? Very good sound effect. More? Yes? Yes? Brilliant! Fantastic, Jeffrey. Okay, thank you. Can we have a round of applause, please, for Jeffrey? Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. That will give the dragon a fiery surprise, eh? Shh. Oh! <gasps> that night, the dragon flew out of the cave. You ready? Oh. Hungry. Oh, sheep. Man. <gasps> the dragon's insides had started to burn. He flew down to the river and began to drink. And that 
was the end of the fire breathing dragon. <sighs> Can anyone tell me what happened to its body? That's right, it did exactly that. And that was the story of the dragon of Krakow. And now I think it's time for me to go and feed my pet dragon because all this lockdown business has made it quite angry. So, um, hmm, let's see what kind of food I can find for my pet dragon to keep it happy. And I'll see you next week for another story. Thank you. Bye. Hello again. So that was the story of the dragon of Krakow. Did you see how many different objects are used in that? Yep, the different props. So using the suitcase as the cave and then the cardigan over the front of it to make the moss. Also to use just the ribbon stick for the fire. Um, and the mixing bowl was both the village as well as it becoming the actual mixing bowl that Krakos then uses too. Um, and the different ways in which the, um, the creatures were brought to life. So I used my woolly shawl for the sheep and the hat for Krakos because Krakos is clearly the hero of the story so he kind of really needed a, a clear identity and a, a clear sort of hat for that to mark him out from the other characters, the three friends that were all created just physically with, um, with gesture and, and vocalization. Um, and the dragon, of course, the dragon was just the physicality. And then again, just using the neckerchief scarf, the red bit as the, as the fire. Um, that was all that was needed in that suggestion. But then of course you can use the scarf later when you're narrating about how the dragon eats all of the um, sheep in the village. And I guess you saw the complicated outcome there in the story. It goes from having to, to make a fiery paste and spread it on the sheep and then the dragon has to eat the sheep and the dragon's body can't take the heat and so the dragon goes down to the river and drinking the river he explodes but all of that is really quite a complicated um, resolution to that dilemma but having those visual aids having the blue cloth as the river and being able to cheat it so that it disappeared helps make each point of that action um, easier for young children to be able to imagine and visualize. So I hope you enjoyed it and uh, there was a little cameo there for my son. He's, he is a little older and he has seen the story many times um, but because we were in lockdown he, he helped me with that and I'm, I'm sorry that you missed some of the sound effects as well with the sound there but I think it gives you a, a good idea and if you want to watch the story again you have the link on your handout you can go direct and watch it there or again you could watch it from the webinar itself um, and if you do want to watch it with your child or with your children then here are just some ideas for how you can extend some of that play afterwards if you have any spare fabric that you can use um, and you could make a cave and then you can get your child to role play maybe being different creatures inside the cave what kind of different creatures can they be and then when they come out of the cave you have to try and guess what creature they are a bit like i do at, at the beginning when i'm when i'm being the different possible creatures and and usually when i'm when i'm working with with children i let them tell me what creature is in the cave and i will just physicalize whichever creature they come up with um, so that's a good way of, of getting them into role play and guess what creature I am by them coming out of the cave. Um, also, you could do the role play of the whole mixing bowl scene. So you could set up that whole situation and um, maybe use a cushion as a sheep and all imaginary, of course, there's no real source at all, but 
make up your own um your own kind of potion what might what ingredients might go in that um and mix it all up together and then spread it on the cushion sheep and see if you can get your child also to to maybe act out the dragon doing that demise there's plenty of fun to be had and as you can see i clearly really enjoy doing that part of the story um also your child could 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 also be Krakos um, and could play the roles of the different different friends in the story. It's a great way to re-explore it by, um, by role play. And I've seen from your responses to the um, initial webinar question that a lot of your children are very happy to act out parts of the story. So this is a fantastic story for them to act out. Um, and then also have a think about other ways in which the villagers might have been able to get rid of that dragon. Normally, I ask the children for ideas of how we can get rid of that dragon. Hmm. Because the fiery paste solution isn't the only solution out there, but also you can explore some of those solutions and see, might it solve the problem or might they come into other kinds of difficulties? So it's a good idea for thinking of problem solving. How can you solve the problem of the dragon in the village? So how can we incorporate those visual aids into our stories, the stories that we read at home? Maybe you're very comfortable now sharing some of those stories verbally without the book there, but most of the time I expect that you'll feel more confident to have that book in front of you. So how can you use these visual aids when you also have a book there? And I I think the best way of doing it is to choose just one or two simple household things. It might be, might be a wooden spoon that you use, or it might be a scarf that you use to help create different, different character in the story, or they might become, oops, they might become wings or, or all manner of different ways of, of being able to, to characterize different, different people through the scarf or, or different, different things, different landscapes as well, might be a mountain as part of it. So if you choose just two or three really simple things, if you do have a sponge, I highly recommend because they are fantastic ways of, being able to just create the simplest of things. That's a cave right there. It really doesn't have to be much more complicated than that. And you can even use that even if you were using it as a bowl. It's about being able to use just one or two things in as many different ways as possible to service the story. And this could become almost anything in the story as well. You can, you can even, you know, as we were talking about the hungry caterpillar, this could become your, your caterpillar as part of it too. So if you can find two or three or even just one household object that can become different things. So what I mean by intelligent material is it's, it's non-prescriptive. A lot of the toys that we buy for young children, fantastic as they are, they are made so intricately, but they're very clearly what, you know, they're very clearly what they say on the tin. <clears throat> I mean, I've got this here, which happens to be um, a mermaid. I mean, it's, it's very clearly a mermaid and it's not so easy to be able to make this become something else. And, you know, that's great for some play, but the wonderful thing about intelligent materials is they can use them in lots and lots of different ways. And so they can service a story in a multitude of ways without feeling that you have to have, you know, a whole number of, of different props that, that replicate the fish. I mean, this, for example, could be the fish. Yeah, very, a very nice fish, actually. And you can even pinch part of the end to make, um, to make the tail. Whoops. Yeah. So that would be my first thing is to choose one two if you're very ambitious three things that you're going to use throughout the story to be the either the character so if you wanted or oh, where's my spoon so if you wanted this to be the character in the story 
or to be part of the environment like the cave in the cave in the dragon story that's up to you but that would be my suggestion um and secondly yeah it's so one way is to make the character i've kind of jumped it a little bit here so one way is to make the character the different things and you could even use the scarf as part of that as well so you can even make the character with the scarf as well or we could have rapunzel here with long hair um, and the second way is to use those objects as part of the landscape of the story. If there's a key part in it, whether it be a house or whether it be a, a cave or if it be the sea, that you can use that material, that object to be that environment, and that landscape. And it would be a really great way of being able to have, if you have two of them, for you to have one and for your child to have the other so that you can both do it put the book down at that section of the of the story and actually just invest in oh in this character or or this landscape yeah it really doesn't have to be um accurate it's about the play that's invested in it and giving context to that part of the story using that visual aid or that intelligent material so suggested tasks for this week can you make a habitat for a mythical creature now many stories have those mythical creatures in them there's the wonderful rock bird in sinbad can you think of another story that has a mythical creature and can you make a habitat in your home for that creature and where that creature might live like if it's a cave can you maybe put a piece of cloth over part of the end of the bed to maybe make a little bit of a, a cave there um so see or using boxes or or pegs see if you can let your child make an environment for that mythical creature and if you do find another story as a second thing that has a mythical beast in it can you share that story with your child using just one or two of those objects to help bring that story to life using those visual aids to find ways in which you can make that story leap out of the page and right onto the bed in front of them or right onto the the carpet or the rug in front of them wherever you're having your your story time so those are the um, suggested tasks that link in with our Dragon of Krakow story and those visual aids. And um, just to say that on the storytelling links there, again, there are a few more um, articles about why storytelling is important for early years, developmentally, ideas for role play, but also some resources for um, sensory projects, the idea of, of there being sensory um, ways of being able to enable children to explore the story through sensory means as well. So there's a link for that too. And also another great theatre link, the Unicorn Theatre in London that has some online, uh, online production of theirs, which is um, the Anansi Tales from Africa. Um, and they're online and free in October so in a few days time in October that should be available if you want to, to watch that as well um, and we are coming to the time for questions so I don't know if any of you have got some questions for me that you would like to put in the questions part of the um, chat box but if you have any questions about any of what we've done today or any things that you've discovered from doing the task um, from last week or anything about um, what I've talked about over the three sessions then please do put them in the chat box and I shall answer them and while you're thinking of your questions um, I have a, a couple of ones that that people ask me and perhaps the first one just to link in with the storytelling links there is 
you know, where can I get my own intelligent materials and visual aids? Where can I actually get that stuff from? And um, the answer to that really is the kitchen is a great, is a great source of um, um, wooden spoons and also shoe boxes. I think shoe boxes, whoops, shoe boxes are very underrated, but they make also fantastic caves. You know, if you put um, a cloth over that, you've got another fantastic cave of what kind of creature might live in a cave like this. Or it could be a house. Yeah, so you can make, or again, you can make it into, it could even be a, um, one of our mythical beast kind of creatures. So shoe boxes are really helpful. And actually, when I was really little, um, I used to go to my grandmother's um, all the time. Uh, well, every Sunday. Great. I've seen a question in the chat box. I'll come to that in a second. So I used to go to my grandmother's and she used to keep a cardboard box of all sorts of odd ends. Um, there used to be loads of empty film reels that were all circular and um, tubes and um, buttons and just all sorts of raggedy kind of objects that she collected that, you know, weren't sorts of things that I was going to swallow, but things that I could, I could play with. And I have such vivid memories of that box being my favourite box of play things because I could go in there and I could go on trips. I would use the, um, the film reels to take me all sorts of places in the box, out of the box. All the sort of buttons were used for all manner of different things. And I'm sure that's where a lot of my desire to make theatre and, and play actually came from all of that imaginative play from that box of those open ended resources. Um, so just to say they don't have to be bought things. Right. Let me have a look at the chat box. That's fantastic. There's a question. How can I involve children in acting out as I tell a story? Example for them to participate actively in the storytelling. Great. That's a fantastic question. Thank you very much for that question. So how you how can you involve them more in the acting out? I think one of the key ways is to give them an object is to give them an object that can be part, that, that they can use to explore the story. So <clears throat> if it's something that is tactile, like a sponge, it's a really great thing for them to have their, to have their hands on. <clears throat> and as you're reading the story, give them an indication, you know, um, oh, this is the cave. Can you make a cave? See if they can make that cave. And see if you can also, how do they think, how do you think that character might feel? Can you show me how that character might feel? So getting them involved in maybe starting to act out some of the um, feelings that that character might have. For example, how do those villagers feel when they discover that their sheep are gone? How are they going to feel about that? Um, so A, have an object that you can give them that they can fidget and play with, but that you then ask them constructively as part of the story that you're reading, can that become something? You know, can it become, you know, could it become the cave? Or, you know, could this actually be the sheep? So that they can act out the sheep. I think the thing about them having an object to invest in, if they are a little bit reluctant to act out on their own, is that they can put their energy and focus into something else. And it doesn't make them feel quite so self-conscious to, um, to have to, to do it, to be the character themselves. That's why the other, the other way is to suggest um, a feeling so that you give them a few stepping stones to become the character don't necessarily expect them to become the character straight away, but how might that character feel? Um, or how does Krakos feel when he's put the fiery paste on the sheep? Is he excited? Um, 
So that can be a good route into role play, but really the best way is through an object for them to animate it a little bit as the sheep, for them to may maybe even use it as the <sighs> dragon. <sighs> because when they've got something in their hands, chances are they're gonna really want to play with it. So I hope that's helped answer your question now. It was a brilliant question, thank you. Um, I don't see any other questions in there, so I'll just come to um, So my child struggles to imagine, so using something that's open-ended, you know, like for example in the um, fisherman story last week when I used my slipper as the boat, some children really find it hard to see the slipper as anything else other than a slipper. So they find it very difficult to imagine that that could be a fishing boat, whereas other children are very quick to come up with fishing boat as an answer or a fish as an answer. Um, and that's because imaginative responses, um, it's not innate in all children. It is something that is needs to be developed like any kind of muscle um, so we can't expect them to be given this and okay can you you know can you make this into a boat for me because um, that's actually quite quite tricky to do so giving them a clear context for how the object is being viewed really helps with that imaginative leap so for example, the slipper in the um, being part of the boat. If you get them to make the waves, splish, splish, they're already starting to create that environment. And then you're able to sploosh, sploosh, sploosh. Or maybe you can even have the sail sploosh, sploosh, sploosh. Um, so being able to give context to it, and the story gives it that context as well, really helps them to start to make the connection between how you're using the object and how you want them to see what that object is. Um, yep. Yeah, and stories are the best way of giving that context because they have context all along which is why it's a brilliant mix to bring your visual aids together with within the context of an actual story so those are all the um questions i think we have for this session thank you very much for that question it was a fantastic one i hope um, i've answered it well and um, just to say that next week it's going to be how you can create your own stories with your children. So this will be particularly good for how to get your children to act out um, and be involved as part of that process. Um, so we're going to look at that in two ways. We're going to look at how you can cr actually create stories from scratch with very young children so under fives and also how you can look at creating stories with those slightly older children, those six to eight year olds, because there they are already at a, a place where they can sequence a narrative in a different way. So we're going to look at it for both stages and we'll look at slightly different exercises for, for each of, of how you can create those stories from scratch. So it'll be a rather different se um, session next week because I won't have a story to share. We'll be creating a story um, together as part of it. So thank you very much. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this session and I very much hope that you get to enjoy the Dragon of Krakow with, with your child and children. Um, and if you have any thoughts over the week, then put them in the chat box next week and I look forward to seeing you then. Thank you. <laughs>